there is no culture in world history that has been subject to more research and speculation than ancient Egypt. The Egyptian civilization is an old one and acts as a direct link to history. While the antiquarian historians of today can be interested in a wide variety of subjects, from Greece to Rome, and from the Babylonians to the Achaemenids, the antiquarian historians of those ancient times would be just as interested in Egypt. The ancient Egyptians were as old to the Romans as the Romans are to us. And as time passes, people die. The ancient Egyptians knew this just as well as anybody else, but they took precautions to make sure the soul got to the next life intact. The next life was said to be in the west, and an ancient Egyptian who had just died was said to be going west, and referred to as a westerner. How the soul got there will be the topic of today's video. Ancient Egypt has always preoccupied the mind of the westerners, but as we will soon see, the westerners have always preoccupied the minds of the Egyptians. Join me as I discuss the Egyptian afterlife and the journey to the next world. The ancient Egyptians were concerned with the afterlife to such a high degree that modern people have a hard time understanding. There are tomes upon tomes of texts from ancient Egypt that were used for getting the soul to the afterlife. Each time period saw new innovations in these texts, and it would be impossible to cover it all in a video like this. For the sake of simplicity, I will be giving an overview of the journey to the afterlife with brief descriptions of innovations in the texts when necessary. Summarizing nearly 4,000 years of Egyptian funerary texts and rituals is a formidable task all on its own, and it would make for an unreasonable video length. We begin by recalling the myth of Osiris. Perhaps the most important myth about the god of the underworld in which Osiris dies and is put back together again. Osiris was married to his sister Isis, and he was a great king over Egypt. Sadly, his brother Set became jealous of Osiris' success, and matters were made even worse when Set's wife, Nephthys, tricked Osiris into thinking she was his wife and seduced him. Set, obviously distraught, decided to hatch a vengeful plan on his brother. Set tricks Osiris into entering a chest that was designed to perfectly fit his body. Osiris is killed, and he is set afloat. Isis grieves his death and searches for his body. She goes to Byblos in Phoenicia to gather cedar for the ark in which the body should be buried. There she finds his body and frees him from the chest. This anger is set, and he cuts the body into 14 pieces and scatters them throughout Egypt. Isis journeys to recover all the pieces. She succeeds in finding every piece except for Osiris' penis. She reassembles the body and brings Osiris back to life. Sadly, since he is not complete, he can no longer rule Egypt and descends into the underworld to be the lord of the dead. She builds a prosthetic penis for Osiris and buries his body. This myth outlined the framework by which the Egyptians cared for the dead. In order to get to the afterlife, one had to be properly buried. Isis even makes sure the body is buried in the correct coffin, one made of cedar which many of the royal sarcophagi were constructed from. The ancient Egyptian concept of the afterlife is further complicated by their understanding of the soul. It's nothing like souls as we understand them today. Just like modern understandings of the soul have changed over time in each religion, so too did the Egyptian concept. I will attempt to summarize it to the best of my abilities. The soul was made up of two main parts, the Ba and the Ka. Just like the ancient Egyptian afterlife, this topic too is muddied by centuries of development and nuance. The afterlife and the texts accompanying it didn't have to fit together or be completely coherent and neither did the concept of the soul. For this reason, I will highlight the main points. The Ka was seen as a spiritual double. It was your life force, containing attributes that made you, you. In a sense, it was seen as a shadow, one that inhabited you while you were alive and left your body at death. The Ka would reside in your tomb and be able to inhabit not only the body, but the statues that looked like you. This is why there was a need for a Ka statue in tombs. It was a statue that resembled you, and the Ka could reside within it to receive offerings. The Ba, on the other hand, was a different kind of soul. Upon death, it would exit your body and be activated, in a way. This was the part of the soul that had to traverse the afterlife and get to the other side. Perhaps it can be seen as a divine spark, whose full divinity would be granted upon completion of its journey. But again, 
there is no consensus on how exactly this aspect of the soul should be understood. When going through the underworld, the goal of the Ba is to reach the afterlife and reunite with the Ka, becoming an Ak. This is usually understood to be the glorified soul. Usually represented as a bird, this Ak could travel freely between worlds. The Ak can be described as the transfigured and equipped spirit of light. Through certain spells that we will discuss later, the soul is glorified and becomes an Ak. Effectively, this means the soul of the deceased is now seen as one of the gods. With an understanding of the myth that framed the afterlife, and a general understanding of the ancient Egyptian concept of the soul, we can now begin our journey to the afterlife. Any good journey needs a map, however, and for this we will have to examine three specific texts. The first is known as the Book of Two Ways. Within the coffin texts, which we will come back to later, there was a certain map that would be drawn within the coffins on the bottom, on the inside. The Book of Two Ways is the first map of the underworld in ancient Egypt. Unlike the Amduat and the Book of Gates, texts that we will discuss shortly, the Book of Two Ways is a precursor to the later texts of the New Kingdom. Its texts were always addressed directly to the deceased, warning them, or even guiding them through the perilous underworld. The journey began at the eastern horizon and sunrise, which is the opposite of how the journey was understood later, meaning this journey was seen as taking place in the sky instead of under the earth. The text describes a circle of fire and the guardians of the gates of the underworld. The book gives the deceased ways to combat the evils along this journey in the hopes of reaching one of two places. First, shown in between the two ways, is the region of Rosatau. Said to lie at the boundary of the sky, surrounded by fire and locked in darkness, this region contained the corpse of Osiris. The deceased would want to reach here to achieve immortality, for looking at Osiris brings everlasting life. The second map of the underworld is the Amduat, meaning that which is in the underworld. It can also be seen as another version of the Book of Gates, which is the third book we will discuss. There is a complex relationship behind these two texts that I will briefly summarize. The books are divided into the 12 hours of the night, and Ra's journey with the king begins at sunset. Both books contain a series of gates that the deceased must pass through. The Amduat and the Book of Gates depict many of the same gods with similar experiences by the deceased. There are, however, glaring differences. It's important to note that in the study of mythology, both of these texts are correct, so to speak. Even though they can be seen as contradictory, they can also be seen as fail-safes. If one didn't work, the other one surely would. It was all about guaranteeing entry into the afterlife. In many of the hours depicted, one could easily see these two as acting together, but that's unnecessary and it would be a forced misreading of the texts. For this video, I will explain the hours and give short descriptions of the contents from both the Amduat and the Book of Gates. In the first hour, these texts depict a very similar event in which the mountains are opened for Ra to enter Duat, the underworld. Osiris is seen worshipping him, and a figure called the Swallower of All appears at the end. This is where everything that has ever existed is contained. Finally, Ra and the deceased king enter the next gate and arrive at the second hour. Here is where the Amduat and the Book of Gates begin to differ. For the second hour, the Amduat describes a land of abundance where Ra gives land to the blessed dead and all their material needs are met. The Book of Gates simply describes an encounter with a serpent that guards the next gate. They pass through to the third hour. At the third hour, the Amduat still describes the land of abundance but it is called the Waters of Osiris. Along this journey, the travelers are accompanied by creatures with knives that can render enemies harmless. This differs greatly from the third hour in the Book of Gates, which describes a boiling lake with 12 gods submerged within. Ra and the King pass through. The fourth hour in the Amduat contains a realm filled with snakes with wings and legs called Rosatau, the place discussed previously in the Book of Two Ways. It's a desolate place with a zigzag route going through it. Along this path, there are blazing fires and false doors. Finally, Ra's solar bark transforms into a fire-breathing snake to ward off all foes. According to the Book of Gates, the fourth hour contains a great serpent that spews out smaller serpents from its mouth. 
Ra calls upon the goddesses of the hours of the night and they destroy and eat the serpent. Once they pass through this gate, they reach the fifth hour. Here, the Amduat describes the primeval waters containing those who have drowned within it. There is a lake of fire that's described as a place of punishment. Isis and Nephthys are depicted in mourning, and slaughterers and serpents are seen on the way out. The Book of Gates, on the other hand, describes the fifth hour as having the timekeepers. They are the ones that allotted space and time to the deceased. The four races of man are also depicted here as the Egyptians, the Asiatics, the Nubians, and the Libyans. Ra is said to give them life. The god and the king pass through one special scene before entering the sixth hour that I will have to preface. The sixth hour is probably the most important one. Initially, I was only going to cover the Amduat, since it is a complete and consistent book. The Book of Gates actually changes depending on which pharaoh's tomb it's in. For this reason, the 8th through the 11th hours differ drastically from the Amduat and from each other, even more so than the hours we've already covered. But I had to include the Book of Gates because it describes one of the most famous scenes of the Egyptian afterlife. The Judgment of Osiris The judgment scene is mostly recognized from a later manuscript from the Book of the Dead, which we will get to, but this event was the most important part of the journey for anyone. In the sixth hour, the Amduat depicts this as the point in the journey in which Ra is finally reunited with his corpse. Remember that it's the Ba's of Ra and the king which are traversing the underworld. All the gods were there to witness this event, and it describes the resurrection of the sun. In the Book of Gates, there is a special scene inserted just before the sixth hour. This is the judgment of Osiris. Here, Osiris is seated on a throne with a line of blessed and justified deceased waiting for final judgment. For both the Amduat and the Book of Gates, the seventh hour is about the destruction of Apophis, the embodiment of chaos, depicted as a large serpent. After passing through the next gate, they reach the eighth hour. Here is where the Books of Gates have the largest amount of differences, so I will only concentrate on the Book of Gates of one king, Seti I who actually had both the Amduat and the Book of Gates drawn on the walls of his tomb. In the eighth hour, the Amduat describes the dead rejoicing for Ra. The god hears the rejoicing as it is, but the king hears it as animal noises or other sounds of nature. In the Book of Gates, more enemies are destroyed. They pass the gate and enter the ninth hour. In the Amduat, the ninth hour consists of Ra providing clothes for the deceased as twelve sacred serpents repel his enemies. The Book of Gates depicts this hour to be one in which the gods are all called upon to help pull the solar bark. In the tenth hour, the Amduat shows a land of darkness. Here lie the primordial waters, with rejuvenating powers. On their way to the next hour, the bark is kept safe by bodyguards holding weapons. In the Book of Gates, Ra calls upon the assistance of the sky goddess Newt. New gods are born and repel the darkness. They journey on to the eleventh hour. Passing through the gate, the Amduat describes this as being the final judgment of Ra's enemies. The Book of Gates depicts this hour to be a peaceful procession for the bark. This time, however, only Ra and the king pass through the final gate. Here, in the twelfth and final hour, Ra and the king are reborn. How were Ra and the king able to get through all these obstacles? It was fairly simple. All Ra had to do was say the word. At his command, gates would be opened, his enemies would be vanquished, and the gods would arrive to assist him. In ancient Egypt, the word was the magic. Although ancient Egyptians had their fair share of rituals, spells were often just incantations, and when they were said by the right person, or divine being, the magic would begin. As another failsafe, there were also spells for the deceased king or his priests to recite. Along with the complicated relationships between maps of the underworld, these too had a long development. We begin with our earliest record of these spells for the afterlife, the pyramid texts. Beginning in the Old Kingdom with Pharaoh Unas, these spells, or utterances, were written in hieroglyphs throughout his tomb. The place was covered from the ceiling to the floor with these incantations. Unlike the journey we have just discussed, which took place in the netherworld, these texts describe a journey that takes place in the sky, 
similar to the Book of Two Ways. They were meant to accomplish three primary goals. First, the king had to awaken in his grave. Next, he had to ascend to the sky. Finally, he had to be admitted into the company of the gods. Interestingly enough, however different the journey may have been in the Old Kingdom, the desire to accompany Ra on his bark is still clear. The question for the pyramid texts is this. How does Unas reach the sky? First, he needs to maintain his magical powers. This was so important to the rest of the journey that a spell for just that was one of the first spells to be read upon entering the tomb. It reads, very simply, Unas does not give you his magical power. Upon reanimation of his soul, he would need to journey to the sky. There were multiple spells within the pyramid texts that gave Unas a variety of choices. Similar to the books of the netherworld that we discussed, these were failsafes. If one option failed, Unas could use a different one. He could fly, ride on smoke, or ascend by a ladder. If all those failed, he could hitch a ride on the ferry boat that transported the gods. After the Old Kingdom fell into disarray, the first intermediate period began. During this period, the pyramids of the Old Kings were prey to grave robbers. Presumably, upon entering their tombs and seeing the pyramid texts, the non-elite now had access to such an afterlife. It was no longer solely for the king. These spells were now usable by anybody who put in the time and effort to inscribe them somewhere. The pyramid texts were quickly integrated into the coffin texts. As the name suggests, these texts were written on the coffins, both inside and out. The spells for these texts served the same purpose as the pyramid texts they were based on. A third of the coffin texts actually find their origins in the pyramid texts, which is why they're so similar. Some are reworkings of the older spells, and others are direct copies. Many of the spells concentrate on the importance of keeping the magical powers of the dead. There is even a spell that gives the deceased the power to consume the magical powers of others. I eat of their magic, I gulp down their powers. Egyptologist Bob Breyer calls this supernatural cannibalism. Some of the spells were designed so the deceased could overcome their enemies. There were even spells to be written on specific things in the tomb. For example, when someone died in ancient Egypt, they believed that they could be called to work for the gods in their death. For this reason, many tombs had ushaptis, answerers, small human figurines that had a spell inscribed on them so that when the gods called upon the dead to work, these would be animated and do the tasks for the deceased. Earlier, we discussed the Book of Two Ways as being part of these texts. The Book of Two Ways was always depicted on the inside of the coffin, at the bottom, so the dead were laying on it. The coffin texts dominated during the Middle Kingdom. Eventually, the spells became so numerous that no reasonably sized coffin could contain them all. These texts were also seen at the beginning of the New Kingdom period, but were quickly replaced by something more practical. The Book of the Dead. This phrase can conjure up occult-like and alluring images to those that are unfamiliar with it. It's not nearly as esoteric as some people think. The development of the Book of the Dead is complex, just like everything else in ancient Egypt. The first thing to note is that the term is a misnomer. The Book of the Dead is not a book in the same sense as we have become accustomed to. Rather, the Book of the Dead is a collection of spells deriving from the coffin texts the pyramid texts, and new spells that function as a way to help the deceased in the afterlife. It consists of spells, incantations, hymns, and rituals. Furthermore, no two books of the dead are exactly the same. Spells differed from person to person. These books of the dead were meant to accomplish similar tasks to the text that came before it. The first part was about the protection of the body in the tomb. The second part was about the journey to the afterlife. The third part was concerned with judgment, and the fourth and final part was about the continued existence of the dead with the gods. These texts were so popular that scribes wrote entire books of the dead with blank spaces for the names, so when a buyer came to the scribe, only their name would have to be filled in. There are numerous interesting spells in the Book of the Dead. For example, there is a spell so the deceased will not be bitten by snakes, a spell for not dying a second time, a spell for not eating filth, and even a spell for not letting the head of a man be cut off. But perhaps the most interesting and famous part of this text is the weighing of the heart. 
In this ritual, the heart of the deceased was weighed by Anubis using a feather representing Mat, the goddess of truth and justice. Any hearts heavier than her feather were rejected and eaten by Amit, the devourer of souls. This was an expansion on the idea of the judgment hall we discussed earlier. If the deceased passed this test, they would pass on to the next test. They would reach the hall of double truth. Here there presided a court of 42 gods. The dead would address each of them separately and deny wrongdoings. For example, the dead would say, Hail Strider, coming forth from Heliopolis, I have done no wrong. Hail Eater of Shadows, coming forth from the caverns, I have not slain men. Hail Doubly Wicked, coming forth from Ati, I have not defiled the wife of a man. And so on. Upon completing this task and some others, the deceased is finally accepted into the afterlife and gets to decide which plant, animal, or even god they wish to be. As stated before, these texts all acted as fail-safes for achieving immortality. The rules for the king and the commoners were different as well. The king had to get through this journey every night, and the commoner would actually achieve the great afterlife they were seeking. Remember that the texts discussed in this video are not all of them. There were many that were included in tombs that we have not discussed. There were many ways into the afterlife and multiple journeys one could take. There were numerous spells that could help and many items that were buried with the dead. All this was to ensure that they would achieve the ideal afterlife. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoy our content and want to help support this channel, check out our Patreon and Teespring links in the description. If you don't want to spend money, but still see what we're doing outside of YouTube, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Also, make sure to check out our website, milwaukeeatheists.com. We'll see you next time.